On this episode, what's going on with shipping? I like big boats, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Sam Coglan. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. Have no fear. I am not doing my Sir Mix-A-Lot impersonation. There shall be no rapping from this person at all. However, we are going to talk about big boats. I cannot lie. So, Rachel Premack, who is new over at Freightwave, she just came over from Business Insider, did an article that I particularly enjoyed greatly, not the least of which she asked me for some comments on it, along with John Conrad. So right from the beginning, we had fun with this article, but she wrote a really great article. And I want to talk about it a little bit because I, I'm going to disagree with her just a little bit on this. Her article is entitled Giant Container Ships Are Ruining Everything. And basically, she makes the argument that she's against big boats. But I got to say, I love big boats. I really, really do. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about her article. If you're new to the channel, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump over to Rachel's article. I like big boats. I said, sorry, I didn't mean it. Sorry, it just gets in your head. It's hard to break it. So this is the article that came out on Freight Waves. Again, Rachel Premack did it on Thursday. Giant container ships are ruining everything. We can blame the big boat era for many of our supply chain headaches. And I, I largely agree with Rachel, let me be clear. But I have this thing about big boats. I really do like that ships are as huge as they are. And there's something to be said about huge, monstrous ships. Having been on ships, having sailed ships, there's something about them. But her article hits some key points, and I think we really need to break them down and talk about them. So I hate big boats, and so should you. Rachel, I, I, I don't, don't understand this. I, I don't understand why we're having the hatred against the big boats. But let's go in here. In 2006, Maersk stunned the shipping community with the introduction of Emmer Maersk, a container ship that could carry nearly 15,000 20-foot equivalent units. And Emma Maersk set off an arms race. So Emma Maersk, when she came out, was absolutely unbelievable ship when she came out. Launched in 2006, she was built up at the Odensk shipyard up in Denmark. Now, this is the shipyard that Maersk owned and built most of their ships out of, they sub substantially closed or subsequently, excuse me, closed it after this. Uh, they launched eight of the eight E-class vessels out of them. And when the, she was launched in 2006, she was designated to be able to carry about 11,000 TUs. That was the official note that was given to her. However, one of the things that we found out was that wasn't true. She was actually configured to carry a lot more than that. They just would not stack the containers as high. And we see her becoming really the change. We see a massive change that happens in the size of container ships with the introduction of Emma Maersk. And one of the great things that Rachel does is link over to some key articles here. This New York Times article, which talks about why the world's container ships grew so big, uh, a really great take on this. If you really wanna see graphically how these ships leap in size, uh, always go back to one of my tried and true sources, uh, Jean-Paul Rodrigue's site uh, on port economic management and port economics management policy. It's great. Also transportation geography, fantastic. But here you see the jumps and the jump for Emma Marisk out of the post Panamax ships, the ships that were basically too large to go through the Panama Canal, all of a sudden jump into the new category that is known as VLCS, very large container ships. And Emma Maersk starts off this arms race that Rachel talks about in here. And today we're, we're in this huge big boat era and the big boat era is there with the largest ship in the world right now being the motor vessel Everlot. And Everlot is a big, huge honking ship. Again, she demonstrates to the world how big, over 24,000 containers on board, absolutely gargantuan in size and a lot of debate about whether or not that vessel, if that vessel gets stuck in the Suez, what happens to the world economy? Of course, Everlock getting stuck in, in the canal is probably better than ever Uranus getting stuck in the canal. I swear that is the actual name of the vessel. I'm not making that up. It's just every time I ever see somebody mention about canals and ships getting stuck in it, this ship appears magically every time it's on the cover of the thumbnail of today's episode. But 
the story here is a really good one by Rachel. And one of the things she talks about here is the growth in size. Every year brings a new larger than ever mega ship. The largest ship class of a given year has increased by 50% from 2012 to today, or nearly sixfold from 1981 to today. If you look at the graph here in 1981, you're about 3,000 TEU. You know, you get over here to 15,000 TEU in 2006 with Emma Maersk. 2013, you see the introduction of the triple E's, the, the 20 triple E's at 18,000 TEU. And now again, we're over 24, approaching 25,000 TEU. Now, no. A couple of notes here I should mention. Number one, these vessels, almost none of them come to the United States. They're not used in the US trade. If you go to the video I did on the CGM, uh, CMA CGM Benjamin Franklin or on the Marco Polo, I'll have both videos up here so you can take a look at them. Those are like the largest ships that come to the United States and they are below the size of the Triple E's. They're not up at the ultra large. They're very large container ships, but they're not the ultra large container ships because they can't work in the United States. They're too big. They oversaturate the infrastructure of the United States where they're used almost exclusively is the Europe to Asia run. So she has a couple of key reasons why she hates big boats. And again, I don't understand. Big boats are awesome. They're great. They're just fantastic. Biggest ship ever sailed on, 895 feet long, 105 foot wide. Awesome. It was great. I love being the mate on that ship. So number one, they underpin the global shipping oligarchy oligopoly. Okay, I'll give you this one, Rachel, you're right about this. So global, global shipping is dominated by a few giant firms. Again, nine firms and three alliances control 83% of the world's container trade. And that's a big issue. As he says right here, up to 60 of the 100 largest ocean carriers have vanished from the 2000s today. In the United States, you saw the demise of US lines in the 1980s. Sealand went away, consumed by Maersk in the 1990s. In 2016, Hanjin went away. You just see it. Today, You know the top 10 largest ocean carriers in 2000 commanded 51% of the market. Today, they dominate 80%. I think it's more than that. I think it's almost 85%, but they're using a White House fact sheet, which I wouldn't trust. Anyway, Goes on to sit here and say, smaller ocean carriers began forming alliances with each other in order to compete with large carriers, said Campbell University Professor Sal McCracklano. Uh, mega shippers decided to copy the strategy. Today, the largest ocean carriers are organized into three container alliances, the 2M, the Alliance, and the Ocean Alliance. This chart, which is a great one from McKinsey, shows you how the Ocean Alliances were aligned in 1996. And then over the span of a very brief period of time, again, you're only talking about 20 years, you go from these kind of informal alliances that were put together to you get these groupings that exist today, largely in three areas. You have the 2M Alliance, you have the Ocean Alliance, and then you have the Alliance. So nine companies in those three alliances, and then the top 10 one out there is Zim, who's really hanging outside of an alliance right now, but is we're probably getting ready to see a shuffling of the alliances coming pretty soon at this point. So one of the things, one of the things that these alliances do is they allow the shipping companies to not compete against each other, but to share routes. And that's what they do. The reason they're viewed as alliances and not as cartels is supposedly they're not price fixing, but they're using routes to basically share up and not compete against each other. And what they've done in the past, again, the alliance system came out in really the 90s when smaller groups were being kind of smaller companies were aligning together to compete against the big companies. Now we see the big companies, 2M, the, the Maersk and MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, are the biggest alliance. And those are the two biggest shippers in the world aligned together, control nearly a third of all the world's containers. Goes on down here, the Lodestar a Global Logistics Publication reported on April 22nd that the 2M Alliance was blanking at least three Asian Northern European sailings. New Chinese COVID lockdowns were one reason for the cancellations, but Lodestar also pointed to 2M's desire to halt the slide in rates amid a slump in volume from China. More canceled sailings mean less capacity for cargo. And right here you see the index for the cost to ship a container. This is the global composite, so it's not a really good accurate depiction of what's happening in the Pacific or the Atlantic. But if you look right here, here's 1,000, here's 2,000. You are basically below 2,000, except for a peak here from 2012 to 2015. Rates are below 2,000. Then what happens with COVID? Boom, through the roof. 
you see it. Now understand spot rates were a lot higher if you were trying to get on certain spot rates. We talked about rates 20, 30,000 at some points. But right now we're sitting at about 7,600 right here. And again, you're hearing a lot of people sit and say, hey, rates are down, rates are coming down, rates are falling, it's great. Well, yeah, they're falling off Mount Everest, but they're still pretty damn high. And one of the things you see is how high they are. You gotta go back to really the end of 20, mid 2021 to have those rates. And again, we just saw shutdowns in ports. Shanghai still locked down. We just saw another port announce lockdowns in the cities. This is going to all hit at the same time. We've got the ILWU now walking out on their labor negotiations. They're going to come back in June, they said, and renegotiate. So rates are all over the place right now. Uh, container ships have been steadily increasing in ship size since they were created in 1956. And I, I agree with that. And one of the things has to do with the cost. Mega city ships were expensive. Emma Maersk, for example, cost an estimated $145 million, but banks were happy to provide the cash. So Captain John Conrad, CEO of Maritime Website G Captain, even John Conrad's in this story. Conrad told freight waves that ocean carriers are ideal lending targets. If an ocean carrier defaults on its loan, you can simply repossess the ship. And conveniently, many receive hefty subsidies or other support from the governments of the countries they're based in. So Maris, the Emma Maris, somebody the other day posted something, said, well, the Emma Maris cost $145 million and carried 12,000 containers versus this ship built in the United States. That's a quarter of a size, but it costs more money. Well, okay, that looks good. I mean, well, smaller ship, more expensive versus bigger ship, cheaper. Sounds like we should build all our ships there. The problem with that analogy is this. Number one, that was in the Maersk yard. Maersk and the Odense shipyard are both owned by AP Moeller. They're not going to make a profit off each other. So therefore, you've removed profits from the cost of the vessels. The Odense shipyard built all the container ships for Maersk up to that point till they close. And now they do it over in Korea. And they were building eight of them, which means they could amortize the cost across eight vessels and it's not a similar comparison at all. Again, it's, it's, I use the comparison all the time. It's go buy the Ford F-150 from a dealer and then go build your own F-150. And when I say build it, I mean, manufacture all the parts yourself. You can do it, but it's gonna be a hell of a lot more expensive. And when you build a hand-built F-150 versus a machinery-built F-150, assembly line built, I should say, F-150, there'll be differences. And that's what you're getting here. But then what happened in 2008, the freight drived up, boom, global recession happened. All these ship companies built these huge monstrous ships because they had this idea that if you build a ship longer, wider, deeper, you carry more cargo, cube, it's cube. You carry three times, you know, or, or excuse me, a cube route of what you would normally carry. And now they got these big, huge, massive ships, but all of a sudden freight dried up. And now they're stuck with these massive ships they can't fill. And she goes here, firm started to say, well, these ships are tremendous investments and there's too much money on the line, said University of Vermont professor Richard Sakati. I don't know Rich, but I agree with him. Let's share the capacity among different companies who would abstainly be our rivals. And that's where you saw the, all of a sudden, the alliances prosper. And it comes to the next point that Rachel makes, the cartel no one noticed. Crucially, this lack of competition didn't bother anyone through the 2010s when ocean rates were absurdly low and carriers were barely turning a profit, if at all. Alliances and consolidations were the only way to make the economics work. Bizarrely, companies continue to build even larger megaships, still chasing those economies of scale while sinking them further into debt. Because so few of them were left, they formed these alliances to stop underbidding each other, Mercagliano said. The US, EU, China, everybody signed off on the idea that these were not cartels. They were not, they're not trust. The reason we did is because we all benefited from it. We love cheap freight. It costs nothing to move goods across the Pacific. Again, when your freight rate is less than $2,000 for a 40 foot box to cross the Pacific, how much cost is there to ship a phone? How much? How many phones can you put in an eight and a half foot high, eight foot wide, 40 foot long container? Thousands of phones. And if you can put thousands of phones in a container, the cost to transport them are minuscule. You don't see them. But that all changed in 2021. Back in February, the White House posted this chart right here, which showed profits for the big uh, container companies in what they had. 
And one of the things that you see here is this massive amount of profit that's taking off here from 2020 up to when they finish this at the end of 2021. But what you need to do is go back on this chart and look at where profits and losses were. Look at the downward turn coming out of 2008, and then the recovery, and then the downward, then the recovery, then down, then recovery, then down, then recovery, then down, recovery, down, recovery, down. I mean, this is not a system that generates a huge amount of money over the track, track of a decade. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that container ship companies had overbuilt. They had competed against each other. Now, all of a sudden, they were underbidding each other. And we all benefited from that. We had huge co cost benefits because transportation was cheap. We didn't pay much. Now, all of a sudden, we're paying more for it. And the container companies, what are left, the nine big ones in the three alliances are now getting them. But here you have the Biden administration are calling the companies a cartel. So second point that Rachel makes, they cause port congestion. That is true. You can build a new ship a lot faster than you can upgrade a port. It has taken 10 years, 10 years to upgrade the Long Beach Container Terminal, what's called the LBCT. And that cost is borne by the people of those communities. This is the other thing. The shipping companies don't pay for these upgrades. The ports do. We have this weird system in the United States where we pit the ports against each other because ports are controlled by states and local municipalities. And so shipping companies are like, well, we're going to go to this port because you're not building to accommodate our vessels. In 2015, when the Benjamin Franklin came into LA, there was a lot of hype about it, but a lot of people sat there and said, we can't handle this ship. If you bring in this ship along with a batch of others like it, you're going to overwhelm the port. And that's exactly what friggin' happened. And what we see is this, the example that I gave that Rachel cites in here was the decision by the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey to raise the Bayonne Bridge that gave access to the Newark terminal, which cost the citizens of New Jersey $1.7 billion. And did they get a return from that? Yeah, ships came in, they did business, you move containers in and out of it. But did they get $1.7 in return for that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But that was borne by the taxpayers, not by the companies. And one of the things we're seeing is this. Uh, one complex is markedly adapted, accommodating those ships, the port of LA and Long Beach. As a result, it claims 40% of US seaborne imports. I also think it has to do with where it's at, obviously. One of the things that reason LA and Long Beach has, has gotten so big is it was the closest port, large port to population center in the United States. Yeah, Seattle, Tacoma is closer by a great circle route, but there's not a big population in the Pacific Northwest. Even Oakland doesn't give you a good concentration of population. LA Long Beach does because it gives you a huge population center. It gives you road and rail across the country that's easier. You don't have to go over the Rockies. You go below them that way. It's, it's just easier to go in there. And that's what we saw. But that all changed in 2016 with the opening of the new lane of the Panama Canal. And now you can have what's called Neo Panamax vessels, old ever forward that went aground in Chesapeake. She's a good example of that. Now what we're seeing is a shift from the West Coast to the East Coast. The problem with the East Coast is this, they're building the ports, their infrastructure is going, Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey, Charleston, Norfolk, uh, Boston, Miami. You're, you're seeing them all competing against each other to outbuild each other. The problem they have is number one, you gotta go through a choke point, the Panama Canal. Right now there's a two week wait going from the Pacific to the Atlantic, what's called the northbound route for Neo Panamax vessels. And it gets worse in the summertime when the lake level gets lower. All right, third point that she makes. They're quietly the reason the ocean carriers for the ocean carriers financial struggle. So by engaging in this mega ship arms race, ocean carriers really just played themselves. They did. When everything was going right in 2006, this is not what their mindset was. The market was fantastic. Growth was through the roof. And these things were seen as a solution to everything. And as she points out here, a 2016 study by Alex Partners pointed out the irony of megaships. In 2016, 2017, global ocean carrier capacity increased by 4.5 and 5.6%. At the same time, demand only upticked by 1 and 3%. Now, 
that sounds bad, but they were also scrapping old tonnage. So getting rid of a lot of smaller ships or selling them off to smaller lines to operate in what's called feeder services. But the companies kept doubling down on this. They kept assuming they're going to do it, but it didn't work for everyone. And she says here, months after the report, the number six largest container shipping company went bankrupt. Hanjin, which had ordered more and more mega ships before its insolvency, was $10.5 billion of debt. When Hanjin went under, I posted some things about this. This is before I got the YouTube channel up and running. I posted some things about this, that there's going to be a field market for their vessels. And I got shot down by everybody. They sat there and said, no, 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 those vessels are going to be scrapped. No one's going to buy those vessels. Pfft, no. They Bought, they got bought out by the companies that ran Hanjin out of business. They saw an opportunity to buy those vessels, scrap their smaller and older tonnage, and grab those bigger ships. If you go in marine traffic, look at a lot of container ships today, and you look at their pictures, you'll see them in their Hanjin livery before they got bought up by MSC, Hophog, Maersk, and a whole batch of other companies. By continually flooding the market with capacity, ocean carriers drove down the shipping rates. Uh, this left them with crushing debt and no way to get, put it back. COVID and the influx of trade helped Many carriers pay off their massive liabilities, but the good times will eventually run out for these companies. Goes on here, praise be, the, the mega ship choke hold on our oceans appears to be loosening. I, I gotta say, Rachel, the glee you have for the end of my big bad boats, it makes me sad, it, it, it makes me sad. Brilliantly, ocean carriers seem to be reading the mind and hastening the end of the big boat era. Of the thousands of container ships in the pipeline over for the next few years, the biggest category is ships ranging from 3,000 to just under 8,000 TEU. And if you look at the chart she has here, which is a chart from Clarkson, which is the ultimate research entity out there. And it's one I can't afford to buy because it's ridiculously expensive. Even with all my great Patreon and subscribers, I, man, I'm gonna to need to really plus up. I'm gonna to need to get to, to, to Britney Spears numbers in terms of uh, followers so, so I can get this. But you'll see right here the numbers of vessels that are out there, the numbers with scrubbers, and scrubbers are these, these uh, method for cleaning the fuel using uh, the high sulfur diesel fuel, uh, those pending scrubbers and the percentage that are fitted with scrubbers, you will eventually see these vessels go away with scrubbers. They're going to go over to just vessels that will burn low sulfur diesel fuel. You see the average size of vessels, the average year when built, and you'll notice the, the oldest ones are the feeder ships under a thousand, and then the intermediate size. And I think this is the reason why we're seeing that building group right here that Rachel mentions. These are the oldest group of ships that are out there right now. And what you see here on the order book is you see the order book for those vessels being pretty high right there. However, I got to say, while well, there's a lot of those vessels out there, if you measure it by capacity, the place you're seeing it in is up here in the Neopanamax. Neopanamax is, I would argue, the real sweet spot right now. Being able to swing through the Panama Canal, that's the bread and butter for a lot of container companies right now. They want to have that flexibility to get their ships through there. 102 ships of that 12 to 17,000 range versus 123 of the three to 8,000 range. It's a hell of a lot more capacity right there. You still see the big post Panamax ships here, but those big post Panamax ships operate in the Europe to Asia route. They don't come to the United States. The US can't handle a 24,000 box ship. Just can't, we don't have the capability to handle that. Now that may change, one of the things I would bank on is that there's going to be a port that's going to sit there and say they can handle it. If I'm going to guess on which port it's going to be, it's LA Long Beach. LA and Long Beach is going to make a play for these big vessels. They're going to make an argument with some of the port infrastructure money to dredge harbor and more importantly, upgrade cranes and more importantly, more lay down area to take these containers in. They can't go through the Panama Canal. They're too big. They barely fit through the Suez Canal. Some don't. Uh, and this is where you see them going. It goes on here. Perhaps I shouldn't speak so soon. One 2016 article in the Financial Times covering a jewelry shipping consultant study claimed that if ships reach 24,000 TEUs, the cost of running such a ship would overtake the profit made from being able to hold so many containers. That would mean losses for the ocean carrier. And yet, dear reader, shipping magnets have gone ahead with the 24,000 TEUs. At least a dozen may be sailing as you read it, or perhaps they're waiting outside the port of Long Beach to be offloaded. I, I love Rachel's stories. I'm not gonna lie. I, I think she's a fantastic reporter. So happy she's over at Freight Waves. 
Uh, I think her story got a lot of traction this week, which is great because she took a very complex subject and made it easily accessible to everybody. Everybody can understand her argument in there. I just think uh, having watched this industry for a long time, I think she makes some really great points. I just think knowing shipping companies the way I do, they love big ships. They really do. They, they love them. They love, it's less crew. It's less ports they have to go into. They deliver more cargo in a more efficient manner. Everything about them tells them they want this. If you look at what happened in the oil industry, that was the norm. They went for these VLCCs, ULCCs, very large, ultra large containers, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 crude carriers. They are gone out of favor now. Now you're back down to medium size. And a lot of people are, are reading the industry sitting there saying, that's the way the container ship's going to go. They, they went really big. Now they're going to come back down to this kind of medium size passenger liners. Passenger liners went huge, you know, Oasis of the Sea, the big, huge Royal Caribbean ones. They went massive. And now with COVID, many of them are sitting there saying, maybe they're too big. Maybe we need to go back down to medium size. The problem is the economy of scale. As long as the economy of scale says we want big, you're going to get big. And more importantly, as long as ports, canals, waterways accommodate these vessels and ports are willing to dredge their harbors and move friggin' bridges higher, then if you build it, they will come. That is the uh, best way I can think to end today's video. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, number one, go over, read Rachel's story. Go over to Freight Waves and read their stories. They're great. They're fantastic. I'm really excited that Rachel is over there at Freight Waves. She does a weekly hit on What the Truck uh, at noon on Freight Waves TV. Go check her out. Be sure to read all the stories coming out from not just Freight Waves, but also John Conrad over at G Captain. And more importantly than anything else, subscribe to this channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. Let Rachel know how much Sal enjoyed his video, her video or her story, but still had some comments about it. And most importantly of all, if you can, hop over to our Patreon page. You can hit the link right here at the end. I forget where it goes. It's one of these spots right here. I can't remember where it goes, but it'll be here. You can go ahead, click on the Patreon page to contribute to our page. So until the next video, Sal, signing off.